Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. At Welcome to Virtual Producer. I'm very excited. We have a very special show for you today. And uh, thank you for watching us uh, wherever you're watching. And if you are watching, please remember you can add comments down here. I always forget which side is which, but I think it's down here. Uh, so please, by all means, ask questions, comments, network, enjoy. We have a cool show and uh, we promise to get you out of here in 30 minutes or less. So, you know, quick and easy. But first, before we get to the exciting guests that we have in the show, a couple of news items that I wanted to chat up. I'm going to scooch over here, new style. So one of them that's very interesting is Midjourney has unveiled character consistency for AI image generation, which means you can give it a character reference and now be able to see that character replicated across many different images. So this is just a little step in the way of world domination of AI. But, you know, don't worry about that at all. It'll be fine. That's one bit of news items, and as we continue to shuffle in, enjoy that. Uh, another bit of news that broke this week, Unreal Engine announces its subscription pricing. So if you've been using Unreal Engine and your company makes more than a million dollars in something that isn't video games, you should find out about this because times are changing for you. But, you know, it's been a beautiful long ride all this way without getting charged. So I guess the free lunch had to end at some point. But anyways, look into that. Very affecting. So that's our news items. And again, thank you everybody who's still continuing to file in. Appreciate it very much. And um, I'm gonna just scooch back so I'm centered now so we can get back to our very exciting guest. And this is actually a first. Uh, normally the way we do this show is I'm sitting here in my little virtual production stage in San Francisco and the guest is dialing in through this little uh, streaming platform that we use. But you know, we, we, we're never in the same room together. But today, we are because thanks to this GD, GDC show, the Game Developers Conference that's in San Francisco, my guest is happens to be in town because he's uh, doing some awesome stuff uh, for Epic Games, which we just, <laughs> which we just mentioned. And um, so he's joined me actually in the studio. So even though it looks like we're in different rooms, he's actually sitting right over here next to me. And let me, let me introduce him. Uh, Phil Goller from Lux Machina. Good morning, Phil. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, good morning. This is awesome. It's great to be here in the studio. Super exciting. So, so I, you know, we should have set up we sh we should have set up a wide view camera, but basically, like, I'm sitting at my desk, and literally five feet away, uh, Phil is is sitting at a ch at a chair, and and my background is kind of a portion of the LED wall, and his background is the other portion of it. So you just have to use your imagination, but. Anyways, it was very exciting and, uh, you know, maybe we'll do it more often like this. So if you're ever in San Francisco and you want to be on the show, uh, please, by all means, uh, give me a call and we'll see what we can do. But anyways, Phil, tell everybody at home who doesn't know who you are uh, just a little bit about what you do and what you've been doing in virtual production, because to me, you are like one of the gods of this uh, of this of, of this industry. Well, th thank you, Nona, and I appreciate um, being here. It's great. Um, so. Uh, Phil Galler, I founded, uh, co-founded um, with a number of my peers, a company called Lux Machina about, well, 12 years ago now, um, uh, centered around the idea that we were going to um, use rendering and display technologies to try to uh, change the way that production happened. Um, we started in broadcast, moved into film, and I've sort of touched everything in between from corporate events and permanent installations. Um, and some of that work culminated in, uh, uh, what I would say, leveraging real-time rendering um, and, uh, and offline rendering, but mainly real-time rendering um, to uh, do something called in-camera visual effects, which is, uh, you know, kind of what you're seeing behind us, putting, putting awesome backgrounds in camera and hopefully being able to go home with some captured footage and not have to do as much post work. And I mean, um, but, but, and, and we're going to look at some clips that kind of take everybody through this, but people think like L these LED walls kind of came out of nowhere and suddenly the Mandalorian just kind of like apparated from thin air, but really it was a kind of long journey and you were, you were doing things that were kind of related to this well before the kind of idea of real-time engines in front of LED screens oh, yeah. was a thing, right? Yeah. I mean, we were working on, um... Productions involving, uh, yeah, well before LED, projection, and then eventually LED when the technology matured. Um, 
uh, using uh, what I, we call it, like media servers, traditional media servers um, that play back 2D content. Um, and uh, yeah, putting it around buildings, putting it around um, in the case of uh, the film Oblivion, a big sky tower mm -hmm. um, that uh, allowed us to capture this beautiful imagery and camera. And that's been going on for, I don't know, 15 ish, 15 plus years, I imagine now. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, no, it's been a great journey. Okay, well, on that note, why don't we start looking at some clips because we have we have a pile of them, and I want to get to as many of these as we can, and also get to people's questions uh, out there in uh, in uh, the, the streaming world. So why don't we show one of these, and then you can tell us a little bit about what we're seeing. But here we go with first clip, which is as you mentioned, Oblivion. We took that footage and we front projected it on a massive screen that surrounded the set. It gave the film a uh, very epic feeling. If we were to do this blue screen, all that blue that you'd see outside the windows would spill into all these surfaces and all this glass, and that would be a virtual nightmare to have to paint out and deal with in visual effects. So the opportunity to get that stuff in camera was the critical design feature in this whole set. There is no blue screen. I mean, what you're seeing is the final product. And we're able to, you know, change the weather. It's sunset, and the next day is daylight, and we have night, and all the clouds are moving. It's all pretty amazing. All right. So, uh, so that, so I understand that. So first of all, that movie is, is, was, uh, quite not a number of years ago, but, but like, was it 2011, something like that? Yeah. 2011. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what's, so what's different there? We're not, the LED <laughs> technology was not quite usable on camera yet. So what yeah. are we seeing? So LED technology hadn't matured yet to the point where it could be used on camera in a way that was uh, noise sensitive. So, um, that is an array of, I believe it was 21 HD projectors um, yeah. that are in various forms, portrait and landscape mode, shot into mirrors, uh, um, make them work. And uh, then about a dozen media servers driving those, um, those servers. Um, and the footage was created by uh, Post uh, Editorial and, they cap and, and uh, Claudia Miranda, and they shot it actually on the top of a mountain in Hawaii. Um, and we only got half of the entire surface, so we actually duplicated it and flipped it on its side to make it look like it kind of wrapped around. Um, but I think it really speaks to the value that something like uh, in-camera visual effects adds, right? Like solves all this water reflection, all, you know, the entire, entire building was chrome and glass and metal and so it was amazing to be able to have that reflection and light and, and really have it play in a way that was part of the show and was the did the was the concept because i mean obviously you know uh, that director joseph kaczynski also did tron legacy which is just like an insanely reflective surface kind of movie was the i was the concept for the sky tower something that was created first and then they're like how can we shoot this without green screen so it's not going to be a total like spillover mess or was it like hey we could do something with projectors maybe you could make this sky tower kind of concept yeah, happen. So, I think it's actually a little bit of both what's awesome about Kaczynski is actually an architect originally um, and so he did a bunch of the architecture work and actually the sky tower made it into an architecture's digest magazine um, and so I think he's also a technologist and a futurist and so I think he was thinking about how to solve these problems while he was designing this thing and so it sort of fits really neatly into this bucket of it's got the right solution, right? And so much of this is about using the right tool for the right job. Um, and I think it was a hand in hand approach. Right on. Yeah. I just, I just watched that movie like a couple weeks ago and I was just like, wow, it's amazing what they did because even then, like the idea of real time animation was not a thing. I mean, there was no way you could have gotten that degree of uh, image quality in, in the real-time engines of the day of 2000, you no. know, 10, 11, right? No, not at all. And actually we did some, what I would call like hybrid real-time work. We actually tracked, uh, manually tracked, um, uh, Tom Cruise's head as he walked on the bridge in the opening scene so they could roto and replace uh, and do a bunch of head replacement stuff. So it was an interesting hybrid of really basic real-time combined with this like intense 2D playback. Right on. All right. Well, I rec if you haven't seen that show and you're into virtual production, I recommend you see it because, like I said, I think it's a cornerstone of uh, this tech. But let's fast forward a few more years now uh, to a Star Wars movie. And I know you've actually done several of these, if probably not all of them, the <laughs> recent ones. But let's look at one that I, I, I think we could say is kind of a, um, a, a stepping stone from the tech that was in Oblivion uh, to something uh, a little more advanced on the on the way to what we're at today. So let's look at this clip from Solo. And here is the cockpit. And here we are in the cockpit. You made it. Over here we have the sliders, light up buttons. But 
I think the coolest part of the ship has to be the hyperdrive. And you get into hyperdrive like this. I never get tired of that. So, okay. So, obviously, in that scene, what's happening in, through the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon? Are we looking at projectors? Are we looking at LED screens? What is that? So, we're looking at projection, um, but it's 4K projection. So, we've sort of leaped up exponentially in uh, pixels per inch in relation to Oblivion. Um, Solo, the movie, actually used front projection, rear projection, and LED um, across the board. But what you're seeing there um, is uh, like a... a part cylinder um, screen that's sort of like the theme park ride wraps the front of the screen and it's about 11 or 12 feet away so it's very close mm -hmm. um, and because it's projection we can sort of rack focus to it because mm. um, so we don't get more in the same way that we do with LED um, and at 4k resolution per projector um, it is incredibly high resolution um, for the cameras at the time so it was great and what about the imagery itself? Because, you know, I, I, that, this, I, I think Solo was, I want to say 2016 or 2017, when yeah. we still weren't really there with, with like something like Unreal Engine. So what's actually being shown from yeah. the, onto the projectors? So this is a perspective corrected um, or projection corrected uh, 2D piece of content. But what we do is we then start to overlay what I would call real-time effects on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, so additional coloring, light cards, um, which we had been using for a variety of things over the years, um, and then effects like laser blast explosions, all that are created in real time on the fly. And then eventually, it, later on in Solo, during one of the speeder chases, we actually use a real-time engine for the first time to create uh, real-time sparks and real-time layers that are generated on the spot procedurally um, to create some really interesting dynamic effects. So, so we're going to do that with Notch. Oh, neat. Uh, okay. not, yeah, the show used Notch, Touch Designer, Disguise, um, and uh, a couple other applications. So it was, yeah, a collection of stuff. It was awesome. And um, so obviously, you know, the cockpit kind of takes up much of the frame and, yep. the, and the screen is quite far away. So are you able to get away without tracking it, basically? You're just kind of shooting it wild, in other words? Yeah, if you imagine the cockpit is sort of always pointed center, right? We're always sort of looking at this central spot. Um, and because we know where things can enter that view, um, it's uh, relatively easy to do like a perspective trick. Like the camera can only be kind of in so many places. And actually in the hero shot of them going to hyperspace for the first time um, in the movie, they're sitting in the cockpit. That is just the projection screen. No post VFX. It got colored. The blacks got tuned down a little bit. And um, yeah, and it, it went to print. So, I mean, obviously, if you watch the original Star Wars movies that were made in the 70s, they didn't have anything like that tech. And what then when they're looking th through the cockpit, they're just seeing a blue screen or a green screen. Do the actors, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, Lando Calrissian over there was loving it. Yeah. Uh, did the actors men mention that this was like a great thing for them, useful to see, yeah. you know, something real outside the window? A absolutely. It was actually one of the coolest I think, moments of my career was uh, everyone from sort of Lucasfilm and Disney and them coming in and like sitting in the cockpit and doing the thing. And I don't know, there's something really iconic about taking the, you know, the handles of the Millennium Falcon and going to hyperspace. And um, the experience that they had and that we had, I think, was unlike any other. Um, I mean, I think it really crystallized for me that we were going in the right direction as a business, which was a really good, um, you know, good, I think, good for me. Nice. And, and I'm assuming when, when he hits, when he pulls the lever in the cockpit, somebody else is like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we actually did make a button that they could push, but <laughs> between the timing of the lines and the speaking, we ended up, yeah, it's just a manual. Someone watching a... Um, uh, watching a monitor and looking for the hands to be in exactly the right place. <laughs> yeah, that would be embarrassing, like, and hyperspace. No, yeah. Hyperspace, hyperspace. There were a couple of those. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, we're yeah. in All right. Well, you know, it, people expect it. The Moon Falcon always was a little dodgy. Um, all right. Well, cool. So, again, on the Star Wars theme, uh, we have a show that I think everybody watching this show um, hopefully has seen. I think if you're into virtual production and you haven't seen this show, you need to go watch it right now. But um, let's take a quick look at this is this is the first season of uh, The Mandalorian, just to kind of see how it was all set up so people can kind of remind themselves where we came from and where we are today. Here we go. In partnership with ILM and Epic, we have put together a system 
whereby which we can have game engine, real-time render, and video wall technology coming together to create a backdrop for the big, beautiful world of Star Wars. The volume is 21 feet tall, it's 75 feet in diameter, run by seven machines, pumping the visuals onto the screen that's, that's being created in pre-production, and can be on the screen within 24 hours of, of being finaled. Right on. Um, wow, okay, there's a lot to take in there. First of all, just can you walk us through a little bit about what, what your kind of responsibilities were <coughs> on that first season? Like, what did you actually do? Yeah. Um, so I think if we go in the Wayback Machine, we had actually started working on iterations of this, both technology and uh, processes, actually before uh, even Rogue One. Mm. Um, so it was 2014 or 2015, um, using a bunch of different mechanisms, sometimes Unreal, sometimes Touch Designer, sometimes Notch, um, to track a camera and start to reveal the perspective and that's ultimately what's happening right what we're doing is uh, designing led volume and, and that you know was one of the the goals of the show was designing led volume um that can be used in camera um that allows some number of computers to render to it in real time so uh we were responsible for sort of uh I would say sort of shepherding that that process through. So um, we helped design the system that got the content to the wall. We helped design the wall. We helped with things like, uh, okay, how, what do light cards need to do? What is, you know, how do we start to implement some of the tools? And then we had um, operator supervisors on set uh, um, helping to manage the video side of things. Um, there's a lot of color that calibration that goes on into making sure things look right. And then um, uh, working next to ILM's tech artists and Epic's uh, artists and operators and programmers. Right on. I, I mean, it looks, it looks, I still, my mind is still blown when I think about what they were able to achieve. Um, let me see. Hold on. I'm, just, I'm seeing a bunch of questions popping up in the uh, channel. So let me just, well, why don't we answer a couple and then right. we'll move on. Um, let's see. Uh, Brian Cardin is asking if he thinks, uh, he's, he's, he, he feels that a lot of the virtual production and, and in-camera VFX jobs seem to be limited to LA. Would, would you... Do you foresee it spreading or has it already spread throughout the world at this point? Yeah, I think it's in the process of spreading. I see a lot of the work actually happening in London. I mm. think there's more stages in uh, Europe than there are in LA. Um, certainly in London, there's a dozen stages. And um, I think also we see stages with Pixamundo in Vancouver, um, Atlanta. And then I think slowly seeing more stages in uh, South Korea, Japan, and certainly in India, um, and of course in Mexico City. Um, so uh, there's lots of, uh, I think lots of opportunity outside of LA. LA will always be a hotbed, I yeah. think just by the nature of it being entertainment focused um, in terms of the majority of the jobs. Um, but I think it's important to remember jobs get ideated in LA, but they happen almost everywhere else yeah. for tax benefit reasons. That makes total sense. Um, okay, I see one more question here. I Okay, that answered that one. Touching on this idea of... Oh, okay. Uh, okay, here we go. This, I think the question is basically... This is from Nikhil. This question is basically, um, right now, an a real-time engine is essentially generating the majority of what you see on the screen. Uh, is it possible that there could be a version of this where layers are overlaid on top of each other and some of those layers are being driven by AI apps or specialized technology? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we would be foolish if we didn't think that at some point we would be layering a bunch of different inputs together to create a image that um, is more comprehensive. And whether that's motion capture data and we're driving a character rig using replicant or some, you know, some other application, or we've got some generative AI background, right? I mean, I think at the beginning of this, you mentioned mid journey, having character consistency, right? I think yeah. if we get to more consistency, it'll be easier to go make me a mountain. And then two weeks later, make me that same mountain, but yeah. in sunset instead of in daytime and I can use it for my other shot. And I think once we get there, um, then yeah, I, I would imagine, I, I don't think the job of the artist goes away. Yeah. Um, I think it, becomes harnessing some of these tools and adjusting workflows so that we can, you know, leverage these assets in multiple ways. Right on. Okay. Well, we're going to jump back to questions in a second, but I want to get to the next clip, uh, which is this m even more recent movie uh, called 
Bullet Train? Yeah. Before we play, I want to make sure that that, I, I saw that on your credit list, but I yeah. don't want to play it if it's not here, but it's for your I'm show, right? I'm excited, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Let's take a look. This is a uh, Brad Pitt movie set entirely on a train speeding through, on a, on a high-speed train speeding through Japan. Here we go. This train is exactly the same as basically the one that I was on. And it's so cool to see all the details in the train and all the details and everything. And we've got the awesome LED screens with the city lights going by. It is such a beautiful, intricate set for how small it is and how limited it is. It just blows my mind at the attention to detail. Right on. Okay, so again, I know I know there's something special about this show because if I remember correctly seeing in the press, this was one of those shows done at the height of the pandemic and just yeah. just getting people into this space was the real challenge. But was there was there something to that in the sense that maybe this was a project that wouldn't have been shot this way if doing it all if they might have gone to Japan and shot on location versus mm -hmm. doing it this way? So I don't know if we would have shot it a different way. I think that um, we would have had more people and it would have been easier to manage. We might have even put up more LED and been able to shoot more. But actually, one of the things that we had to do was find a way to move the LED in a very convenient manner. And of course, because the train cars are long and straight, what we did is we had 200-foot walls that were able to move horizontally in the stage um, so they could go between two different classes, like a first class and an economy class of car. Mm -hmm. um, and that allowed them to simulate a much larger train that, you know, maybe with more people they wouldn't have been able to build or they would have had two shooting crews. Um, but it was great. It was a great application of the technology. Um, and yeah, definitely my show. I worked um, designing the solution um, with the visual effects team um, and the DP, uh, yeah, mid, mid COVID, probably June, July, August. And then I think we started in September, October, went to February of 2021. Um, it was great. Um, in a similar vein, uh, you know, to the question that was just asked, it's a whole bunch of composited layers. So mm -hmm. it is um, a background uh, layer. And then on top of that are street lights that we add on that we can trigger randomly, tunnels that we can trigger, uh, trains that we can trigger, with the idea being that at any time we could create something that was totally a unique moment in time. So a train goes by here, a street light goes by here, and but we've got this background behind it. Um, and that created a, a ton of flexibility with very few um, assets. Okay, and I and we have we have a final clip coming up in a second that, that kind of gets into this, but before we do, I, I'm just kind of curious, you know, um, people who are experience with this process, understand there's the concept of in-camera VFX and there's the concept of kind of almost in-camera VFX in the sense that it's it's not always necessarily the goal to get final pixel shots yeah. in the camera that oftentimes it's more important to get lighting reference or spatial reference for the actors and the crew. Um, when, when you're looking at something like this, what percentage of the final shots are more or less what the camera saw versus, you know, they took that as the basis and, and added additional VFX on top of that. Yeah, I think that for most of the show where they're sitting and they're having conversations in the train car, um, all of that is probably captured and used. Um, mm -hmm. I would say something like this 50%. Um, if we look at, we go back to an Oblivion and we look at like the Sky Tower, um, it's probably about, you know, the same. I think at, at one point they had estimated it, there were 1,600 visual effects shots in the show and we carved that number in half to about 800. Um, and that, so, it, you know, about 50% of the work I think gets kept when we're doing this 2D work. I think it's less when we get into the 3D environments, there's a lot more complexity, but we're also seeing a lot more of the screen. So there's a lot more to add with layering and artifacting and correcting of stuff. You know, it's easy to hide a little bit of more outside the window of a moving car train with the screen 20 feet away. Um, it's much harder to do it when it is the entire background. Um, and you know, it, it, there, there's there's this perception out there that it's like it's it's an all or nothing thing that it's like I either get everything on a green screen and I do it all in post, or I get everything on an LED wall yeah. and I don't have to do any post. But really, it's kind of a continuum, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's a continuum, um, and I think it's important that we like when we think about onset virtual production. Onset virtual production is really like encompassing all these different tools and techniques, right? Whether it's motion capture or it's ICV effects or it's uh, green screen and blue screen keying, right? These things can all work together to help us tell a story better. And that's what we should be doing, right? We should be trying to tell better stories. And I think um, the, the goal of, oh, it has to be all ICV effects because that's going to save me X, Y, and Z dollars is uh, probably not a great thing to try to chase. I think it's 
what story do I try to tell and how do some of these tools plug into the various parts of the story? Right on. Well, that's, and that's what I've been trying to do. Everything I write, I try to make that clear that it's not, it, it's not about like all or nothing, but yeah. Okay. Exactly. Um, so we have one more clip uh, to show. Uh, and this is a show that it just came out uh, on Apple TV Plus, a streaming show. And uh, it has a personal place in my heart because my grandfather, James Daly, was a, uh, was a waste gunner a, on a World War II uh, B-17 bomber, of which this story is all about the insanely harrowing experiences these guys had uh, fighting uh, over uh, Europe. So why don't we take a look at that clip and then we can discuss what it does and let's see what happens here. Here we go, Masters of the Air. The combination of the construction of the plane with content walls gave the boys the real feeling of fighters going by and shooting at them. And I think it helped their reactions and them really feeling what the terror might be like. Open fire, let them have it! The volume is a gift. It's phenomenal. The gimbal's moving. If you're looking at that plane, it zooms past. You know, you're in the plane, you're fighting. All right, so wow. This, if anybody, if you don't have Apple TV Plus yet, consider getting it just so you can watch this show because it's like just mind blowingly epic uh, what they did with the show. So, talk us through a little bit about um, the setup that they were using for this for the show. Yeah, totally. So, um, working with uh, Steven Rosenbaum, um, which was an awesome experience, the visual effects supervisor, who's actually also a San Francisco native. Oh. Um, <laughs> and uh, he um, uh, helped sort of guide the process of what, um, what could get captured and how would we do it in a, in a, a really tangible way for the talent. Um, the idea was build a couple of LED volumes, one that was intended for uh, cockpit, gunner, waste gunner, uh, ball turret work. Um, for like fuselage or smaller parts of the, the plane and then build a larger sort of flat wall, flat-ish, I'm not talking quite flat, flat-ish wall that was really good for things like um, long parts of the plane looking out and then environment work. Um, and so there actually ended up being about two, sometimes three volumes on, on running at any one time. Um, and uh, I mean, I think Callum summed it up perfectly in there. It was an awesome experience that I think added to the believability and the ability for the talent to react to what they were seeing in a way that you couldn't do any other way. Um, it was a hybrid of both, uh, you know, real time work, but, um, also dynamic, um, I can think of it like an, almost like an on rails flight simulator with dynamic action, mm -hmm. uh, you know, add flak at gunfire an AD can call for something to happen. We need to change the speed. We need to give them more time to fly. Um, all that was built sort of, well, on the fly, no pun intended, but, um, yeah, it was an amazing, it was an amazing experience. I spent about eight months on that show in, in England and, um, uh, loved every second of it. And so, um, just, just so I understand, uh, because I know there's a lot of different ways that, that these things are done, you know, in terms of like what software is running, but you, you at Lux Machina that you kind of have a pipeline that essentially leverages unreal entirely like you're not using like a disguise or a pixera to yeah. kind of combine these elements correct so this was um i don't know about 16 active across the two uh, yeah two, uh, uh, two clusters but basically 16 active nodes and then 16 backup nodes um so we do an a and b system all out of unreal engine um and, and display natively to the wall um, we've made some tweaks here and there, so I don't know if I would say it's exactly the epic, uh, the epic version, um, <laughs> but there is uh, uh, modifications that we've done to streamline the process, um, allow us to troubleshoot faster and, and work in more live environments, um, and uh, that served us really well. Almost all of our shows that leverage Unreal are done that way. Um, we rarely will use a third-party media server, um, and part of that is just uh, we often feel like we need direct access to what's happening and to be able to make changes on the fly that... We don't necessarily have the time to go talk to a software manufacturer, explain the problem, get the response time. Right. Um, there's also a cost burden with doing that other work. So. And just so, again, so people that are watching the show understand that what they're seeing is kind of a combination of what was captured in camera and then animation kind of added to that. On, because, I mean, obviously you've got these insanely complicated dogfights where planes are shooting by at hundreds of miles an hour. And, you know, just to get through that at, at a photorealistic look would have been a challenge for the amount of, because it's just, wall, if you watch the show, it's like, there are full episodes where it's just wall to wall, like aerial battle forever. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's an interesting 
interesting solution, I think, and, and Steve and the team did an amazing job, which was to um, keep as much of the content, I think, as they could, and then go in and roto the rest and do post the effects where they needed to. Because, yeah, I mean, this was uh, 2021 into 2022. Um, I mean, even today, real-time volumetric clouds and air combat are not something you're going to be doing at a, you know, an 18K resolution um, in real time. So, um, you know, things are getting better, but they're not still quite where they need to be for that. Right on. Um, okay, well, we're just about to get to the end here. Uh, we're, we're at the 30 o'clock hour, so we're going to wrap up in a second. But I see there's one more question here uh, from Ryan Carty. Do, 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 do. Um, oh, <laughs> somebody asking you for a job, basically. But <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. But the, it's, 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 it's a student, um, you know, and the, the, the question is, how does, I guess the, the, the question that may be more relevant than, can I get a job right now? Yeah. Of course, Phil's going to hand you out his email. Um, wh- how do people break into this or, or what yeah. should they be studying or what should they be into if they're interested potentially in pursuing the, you know, the, kind, of, the kind of stuff you do? I think general production experience is important. Understanding mm-hmm. uh, onset etiquette, the soft skills and the technical skills of dealing with cameras and dealing with other onset technology like lighting and like DMX. I mean, like, you know, in the studio you've got here, you're touching all these things, right? And it's a, it requires a really broad knowledge base. I think from there, it's associating yourself with either a business like Lux, Mm -hmm. um, a a standing stage or a visual effects company um, and going for like a generalist job, um, you know, an onset generalist or an operator assistant, something like that. Right on. Um, Oh, and I see there's one, I promised that would be the last question. And, and, and sorry, Ryan, I didn't mean to overspeak about you, you wanting a job, but I'm sure we, we can get you one anyway. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're, just keep at it is what we're trying to say. Like, study. We'll get there. Um, somebody else is at Okay, Brad is asking uh, any insight uh, if we will get real time in UEFN to make perpetual studio worlds. That's interesting. Do you have, is, is, could, uh, there, could there be a perpetual filming world one just drops into and out of to shoot so i think the answer is yes whether it's in uefn or another platform i can't really address but um i don't see a version of the world in the next five to ten years where everything isn't more online more connected and more accessible right um uh, for lack of better words, the metaverse of it all, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I definitely think there's a need for transmedia that uh, allows, you know, like a virtual experience like the one we're having right now, but in a virtual place as opposed to in a physical place. So, yeah, I, I definitely see that in the tea leaves. Right on. Okay. Um, so we're at, so we're so we're over time. We're going to wrap up here. Anything else that folks should know? Any plugs you want to throw out? Any you know any shout outs you uh, want to give? <laughs> yeah, I mean like thanks to everyone who helped with those projects across many like hundreds and hundreds of people helped with all these projects. It's not you know certainly not just me and not just Lux. Um, and yeah, uh, thanks for having me. This was an awesome experience, and uh, I was glad to share my my uh, my knowledge and and some of my experiences with the audience and with you. So thank you very much. Okay, and I'm going to I'm going to do a little trick here because just in case nobody believes that we're in the same room. Hold on. I'm going to I'm I'm going to I'm going to dis- this this should be funny. I'm going to disappear from my frame and go over to Phil. Hey everybody. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, thank you again, uh, folks, for watching uh, Virtual Producer. And uh, please tell all your friends, like, subscribe, hit the bell, whatever it is they do these days. And uh, we will be back with more shows soon. And um, thank you again to our to our um, supporters, everybody watching. Uh, thank you for asking questions. Feel, feel free to keep putting questions into the chat, and we will continue to answer them because this, this thing lives on. And um, yeah, thanks again. And here we go with the credits roll. And please patronize our supporters because they make all this possible. Thanks again. Bye, everybody. Thank you.